now before we begin today's program, I think we need to pause. Uh, last night marked the passing of one of the great Americans of our time, a woman of great humanity and compassion and vision who was an inspiration and a beacon for many of us. Dr. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is who I'm referring to. And I know that many of us are sitting today with very heavy hearts, wondering what is our uncertain future holding for us. And so before we consider the questions of the future, I think it's important that we actually hold space and remember the beauty of this spirit that graced us and that we hold tribute to her life and her dedication to humanity. So let us hold now a moment of silence in memory of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Thank you. Today's program, From Barbed Wire to Defund the Police, a community conversation on surveillance, detention, and incarceration, weaves together Japanese American incarceration with contemporary examples of mass incarceration, state surveillance, and immigration detention. And I'm very pleased and honored and proud to introduce uh, my friend and co-chair, uh, our mo moderator today, Carl Takei. Carl is a Suda for Solidarity co-chair and a Yonsei descendant of prisoners held at Tuli Lake and Amache, as well as the Department of Justice camp in Bismarck, North Dakota. He currently lives in New York City and is a senior staff attorney, attorney at the National ACLU, where he coordinates police practice litigation and related advocacy work. Previously, Carl conducted litigation and advocacy at the ACLU on prison privatization, immigration detention, and related issues. He is lead author on several ACLU reports focused on immigration detention. And Carl has testified before the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, testified before a working group of the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and briefed members of Congress regarding private prisons and immigration detention. It is my great honor to introduce you now and to hand over this program to Carl Takei. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, so uh, I'm very grateful to be here and very grateful um, as well to um, have our distinguished panelists. Um, uh, Claudia Munoz was born and raised in Monterrey, Mexico, and has lived in Texas since 2001. After her nephew was detained by ICE, Claudia began to organize with other undocumented youth nationwide to secure his release and demand dignity for all immigrants. She then graduated from Prairie View a and University in 2009, and since then has worked for various labor and immigrant rights organizations throughout the country. She's currently the co-executive director of Grassroots Leadership, an organization that works for a more just society where prison profiteering, mass incarceration, deportation, and criminalization are things of the past. Our other panelist, Alia Hanna Hussein, is an advocacy program manager at the Center for Constitutional Rights, where she manages CCR's advocacy and campaigns on indefinite detention at Guantanamo, the profiling and targeting of Muslim, Arab, and South Asian communities, and accountability for torture and other war crimes. And she travels regularly to Guantanamo to meet with CCR's clients. Um, and I'd like to just start, uh, you know, so that folks can understand where each of you are coming from. 
Claudia and first uh, first Claudia and then Alia, uh, could you just describe your organizations and the perspectives that you bring to this panel? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Carl, uh, for that introduction and for this space. Um, so something that's not um, in my bio, but that I do want to share with you all because it gives context to my role in this work um, is that I have lived as an undocumented woman in the U.S. for 20 years. I am not eligible for the Fair Action for Childhood Arrivals, and I am currently in deportation proceedings um, and have a court hearing pending. I have been organizing for nearly 15 years uh, since I was in high school, and I have worked at grassroots leadership in Texas, where my sisters live. Um, and I've been at grassroots for three years now. My mom uh, and my brothers live in Mexico, and my mom definitely thinks I am too rebellious, but I am the youngest of nine, so that is okay. Um, and about grassroots leadership, um, at grassroots we work every day to make sure that one day we can live in a world that's free from mass incarceration, um, deportation, uh, and, and criminalization. And we do that by building community with others, most of whom are or have been impacted by <clears throat> these systems. And then together we come up with the tools to directly confront the current existing systems and institutions of really disorganized violence that are causing us harm and dehumanizing us in the process. Uh, and there's many of those systems, but for us, we know that at the core of punishment, cruelty, and dehumanization is alienation. So a lot of what we do is um, aimed to addressing that. And we address um, alienation by literally accompanying people when a harmful system or a byproduct of that system um, comes for them. And it goes from having a hotline that people can call for any immigration or enforcement or um, related issue to having open hours when people can come talk to us, accompanying people to the courthouse uh, for any criminal justice matter or immigration matter writing letters to judges, visiting people who are detained, really just being in conversation all of the time um, with our folks. We also do a lot of um, creative activities, so we celebrate each other. Uh, we find joy in the midst of so much suffering so that we can continue to be reminded of our humanity. Um, and I think for us, you know, when somebody sees themselves as a full person who is not alone and works to understand that and then beats the system, starting at a really small level, we can, um, we can build from there. And so grassroots leadership um, staff is comprised of about 90% directly impacted individuals. Um, and the communities that we center and work with are mostly all directly impacted um, and, you know, we have allies who support our work. And I, I believe we're one of the few orgs that decided, made a really intentional decision a while ago to work together at the intersection of criminal justice and immigration and really break the silos that separate us. So that's me and grassroots. So thank you once again. Hi everyone, I'm Aliyah Hussein with the Center for Constitutional Rights. So happy to be here. I'm happy to call Suru for Solidarity Allies. I think since they were founded and um, you know, really grateful the, about, for the relationships that we've connected um, and created with the Japanese American um, community. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, the Center for Constitutional Rights, for those of you who might not be familiar, is a social justice, legal, and advocacy organization. Um, we've been around for over 50 years, um, and we believe that uh, the law is just one tool of many that can be used to fight power and build communities. More often than not, the law is used as a tool of oppression and we recognize that. So um, we are a national organization, but based in New York City though, right now, a little bit of everywhere um, and really taking the lead of um, systems impacted individuals, communities and movements um, and following their vision for the world that they wanna see in our work. Um, we've challenged different aspects of the carceral state. Um, what I've focused on at my 10 years at CCR um, is um, we represent men at Guantanamo. We were the first lawyers to represent them and fight for their rights. 
um, within federal courts through habeas corpus um, will probably be the last lawyers at Guantanamo kind of doing this work. Um, and also um, working with um, Muslim, Arab, and South Asian communities in the aftermath of 9-11. Um, that aftermath is still continuing to this day as we know that post 9-11 era has um, continued and it has, um, it has shifted and it has changed, um, but we're still working on a lot of that same work. Um, and I come here as an advocate. I'm someone who has worked with these communities. Someone as a Muslim, Pakistani Muslim American has some um, personal experience with this. And I also come as a student of, um, of history and there's still so much learning that um, I have and want to do about our past and, and sort of movement work now. So really excited to be in connection um, with all of you. And I'll just say that last night I was comforted by um, a tweet of a colleague and a friend who reminded us that some of the most celebrated Supreme Court cases um, are the ones that are have been um, really connected to organizing and movement work um, and that we can never um, forget the power of, of people in organizing. So super excited to be here today. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, so we're going to spend about the next 45 minutes in a panel discussion and then we'll shift into breakout groups after that uh, and then come back to the larger group. Uh, the, the topics that we're discussing today, uh, policing, criminalization, surveillance, incarceration, and deportation, are all ones that share interconnected systems and histories. So that's what we're gonna be talking about in the panel here. Um, there's also one thing that I just wanna address up front. We don't have a black panelist today. Um, this is a truly crazy time for many black activists and leaders. We extended a number of invitations and um, understandably folks had incredibly packed and difficult schedules. Um, and uh, you know, uh, none of the folks we invited were available. Uh, so you know, we're going to just work to ensure that we have a robust discussion among the groups that we have today. Um, but I just wanted to name that. This story has to begin with origins, and specifically the origins of policing in America. Um, the first city police department that was municipally funded in America was in Charleston, South Carolina, and its purpose was to be a slave patrol, to uh, monitor and surveil the black enslaved population of the city, to ensure that uh, you know, they were not engaging in any planning of rebellions, that uh, any social uh, um, engagements that um, Black enslaved people were having uh, were not endangering the system of white supremacy uh, that was legally and culturally, culturally in place um, at the time. And uh, after the Civil War, this same role for policing continued with police enforcing the black codes that restricted black life after the end of the Civil War, with local sheriffs being intimately involved in a system called the prisoner leasing, where, um, for example, it was illegal uh, in many of the former uh, Confederate states for a black free person to go from city to city without having a job in the city that they were traveling to. Uh, a person who violated these laws could be arrested by the local sheriff and they're you know, then forced into servitude uh, by plantation owners, by factory owners who are working in cooperation with those sheriffs and with the criminal legal system. All this continued into the 20th century. And, it, and there's one moment that is, is a crucial moment to understand, uh, which is the 1921 massacre in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the destruction of Black Wall Street. For background, um, Black Wall Street in Tulsa was, you know, one of the wealthiest Black communities in America. It was, you know, vibrant culturally and economically. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if you don't have a, you know, a cultural backdrop to this, just imagine like, a, you know, the Japan towns that you remember from, you know, uh, you know, being described before the war, uh, but bigger and wealthier. Um, and uh, there was an incident in which a black teenage boy was accused of assaulting a white teenage girl 
a group of black men went to the local sheriff to ensure that uh, he would be treated fairly, that he wouldn't be lynched. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they spoke with the sheriff. As they were walking away, uh, a, a white mob approached them and um, the violence begun by that white mob spilled into two days of incredible uh, destruction and violence in which uh, it, it even included uh, white men flying private airplanes, dropping balls of burning turpentine onto Black Wall Street. Um, and the entire uh, Black commercial district uh, and many area, residential areas, you know, where Black people were living in Tulsa were completely destroyed. It's estimated that in current dollars, uh, there were more than $32 million in property damage to these Black-owned businesses and Black-owned houses. Um, and through all of this, the police stood by and did not intervene. Um, it was clear that they were there not to protect the property interests of Black people or the lives of Black people, but the property interests and lives of the white people who were inflicting all of these harms. Um, and that is a pattern that has continued for decades and decades since then. And it, you know, it, it's an important object lesson in what we'll be talking about today, that uh, all too often um, policing and the law are shaped by the interests of those who have power. And that is all too often in service of white supremacy. And all of this intersects to you know, all kinds of areas of American life. So going back to 1921, uh, during the same time period, there were changes to immigration law. Uh, Claudia, can, can you speak about those changes and what motivated them? Yes, absolutely. Um, and I do want to give a disclaimer that I am an organizer, so I'm much more heavier on the practice, uh, not so much on the theory, but there are some things that for historical context, um, I have come to learn. There is a really good book, if you're interested in a lot of this history, called um, Bands, Walls, Rates, and Sanctuary by a professor um, at the University of Illinois. So I am dropping the link on the chat in case folks are interested in that. But um, yeah, so there's two things, there are many things that happened in the 1920s and 30s, but there's two things specifically related to uh, xenophobic immigration policy and practice. The first one, um, and it's important to know that this was a time of economic hardship, anti-Black hate, um, and xenophobia. And similarly to our times, there was a businessman with no experience in elected office who became president um, during those years. Um, Herbert Hoover was his name, and he promised to stash immigration by 90%. So in the 1920s, um, from 1929 to 1936, there was a wave of raids and mass deportations, mostly of Mexican nationals, that resulted in the removal um, and violent deportation of about 1.8 million people. Then in 1925, there was a proud white supremacist from North Carolina named Coleman Livingston Blaze. And he initially was um, an elected official in South Carolina, but he was elected to the U.S. Senate um, in 1925. He was openly racist and xenophobic. And in those years, it wasn't really unpopular to be openly racist, but imagine just how racist it had to be to stand out above just all other races in those years. So he proposed racist law after racist law, and most of them did not make it through, but there was one of them, uh, one that effectively criminalized migration, and it's still used to this day and was used to try to justify the infamous um, family separation crisis at the border at the summer of 2018. Uh, and through this law, thousands of people are convicted and sent to prison every day. So the, the code is uh, 1325 and 1326 for illegal entry and reentry. So 
unlawfully residing in the U.S. had been decriminalized by the Supreme Court. Um, and so he instead went after unlawfully entering the, the United States uh, and made entering into a misdemeanor and re-entering after a deportation into a felony, both punishable by a fine or prison time. Um, and in the past, you know, the federal criminal courts mostly prosecuted corrupt um, corrupted officials and as such, but now the majority of cases um, are those uh, of people with charges with illegal entry and re-entry. For folks more interested in how this plays out specifically at certain areas of the border, you should look up Operation Streamline, the really horrible operation that happens um, almost daily where mass number of deportations um, are carried out and where a lot of times these codes are used as a justification. And so these laws, uh, of course, also gave way to the rapid growth of the U.S. federal penal prison system, which was relatively small in the 1930s. Um, at that point, there was just really a handful, about five federal prisons. Um, currently, we have well over 100, about 110, I believe um, it's the number now. Uh, and now it's just so intertwined into everything that we do uh, that there's county jails and other facilities who have contracts with uh, the federal government to hold individuals under these charges. So um, I think uh, sort of the takeaway for us, right, that have been studying this and working with individuals charged with illegal entry and reentry are that many laws um, are weapons that under any oppressive system can be really used for anything that that certain administration deems necessary, right? And in a system built on the violence that the U.S. was built on, um, and given the fact that the criminal legal system was assigned almost entirely by those who committed the violence, um, there are really very few laws that we can trust. And you know, all of this, you know, this machinery that Claudia is describing that was built up during the 1920s and 1930s was then very quickly used against our community. Um, you know, during World War II, uh, with the roundup and emptying of Japan towns and then our incarceration, um, you know, the, uh, there were two types of camps, the WRA camps and the DOJ camps. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that the agency that ran the DOJ camps was Immigration and Naturalization Service. That is the federal agency that you know, was massively expanded by all of these new immigration restrictions that were created in the decades before World War II. And it is the predecessor to the modern day ICE. Um, and then, you know, so, let, let, let's move to after World War II. Claudia, can you talk about um, the treatment of migrant Latino laborers in Texas? And I, also, I want to make sure that we, we don't lose the thread of, you know, Crystal City in Texas was one of those DOJ camps. And um, the, you know, um, you know can, can you talk about, you know, the, the history of these sites? And um, Yes, absolutely. Um, and thank you, uh, Mike, for pointing out that these codes were used to criminalize South Americans as well. I think throughout the history of, of these laws in the book, they have used to criminalize different groups of people, um, again, as a weapon against different uh, minorities. So, um, but about, yes, about um, migrant laborers in Texas. So as, you know, wartime industries absorbed U.S. workers, um, Farmers really became desperate for what's always known as low cost labor, right? Um, and in 1942, the US and Mexico jointly created what's called the Bracero program or the labor program, which encouraged a lot of Mexican people, my grandfather was one of them, uh, to come to the US as a contract worker. Braceros were uh, generally paid extremely low wages and worked on their conditions that most U.S. citizens were really unwilling to accept. Um, and they were treated so poorly in Texas that for a period of time, the Mexican government actually refused to send any workers to the state. But nonetheless, there was a lot of poverty and the program was very popular and especially with U.S. farmers um, who wanted to exploit this labor. Um, and there's, I think there was about over 5 million Mexicans who came to the U.S. as braceros um, under that program. So 
Ironically, though, as that was going on, um, there were there was another wave of um, mass rapes and deportations happening that lasted well into the 1950s and deported over 4 million immigrants. But what was happening particularly with the laborers is that, you know, as people started, you know, I always say that um, we, we have ancestral uh, ways of dealing with the land and with each other and being in relationship. And inevitably when people were being abused and exploited, people started to work together and attempted to organize. And, you know, it was during those years, the early years of the United Farm Workers, it became more famous in the 1960s and 70s, but during those years, people had started to, um, you know, work together and, and organize. And of course, we know that the police, um, has been used historically in this country to break away strikes and labor organizing, and that's what happened in Texas, right? There was a lot of repression and even more abuse um, and deportations that, that were happening. And I want to um, just really put into context with a very specific example here. So at grassroots we work at a um, detention center where we were not able to visit right now, but we have a visitation program and we're in touch with women who are the pain at the heart of detention center. So the heart of detention center, and another thing for context, there's 254 counties in Texas and we have 184 detention centers and countless, um, you know, state jails and prisons. And so in most rural parts of Texas, you will find a prison or a detention center or a jail or sometimes all three of them in the same complex. Um, as it is the case. But um, the huddle, you know, the detention center is in a really rural town of Texas called Taylor, Texas. And Taylor is um, the, you know, the place where uh, the founder, co-founder of CORE Civic or Correction Corporations of America, he was born two towns over and the detention center is, is named after him. Well, that land where huddle sits was a parking lot used by farm workers, uh, Latino farm workers who came to Taylor to work on the, the fields around there. They donated that land to the Catholic Church who then sold it to um, CCA for $10, I believe. And it's now, it was first a state prison and it's now a detention center. And so I think when we talk about labor and the relationship be between labor and the land um, and immigration, you see just a lot of violence happening in many different, uh, many different ways, right? That it's still among us today, right? And these are the very things that we are um, working to undo. Yeah, and, and just to add a few more details, you know, I, I mentioned Crystal City, Crystal City earlier, the DOJ camp there, after the end of World War II, um, the fence around the Crystal City camp was taken down and used to build pieces of the first border wall on the U.S. border with Mexico. And Crystal City itself, the site is just down the road from Dilly, Texas which is one of the, you know, it is the largest modern day family detention center in the United States. Um, and the site of Dilly actually, before it was a detention center, was what was called a man camp, which is, a, you know, again, a labor camp for migrant laborers. Um, so, it, you know, just, you know, even the land itself is implicated in all of these different ways in which, um, you know, law enforcement and private interests intersect um, in ways that uphold white supremacy and are used to target, you know, like certain groups of people, especially people of color. Um, now, as we move in further into the 20th century, uh, in 1965, the racist immig immigration quotas of the 1920s were abolished. Um, you know, I, there, there's also a much long, you know, a big, much bigger story there about how, as part of that general liberalization of removing the racial quotas, um, the Bracero program that Claudia mentioned was ended, and um, there, there were massive deportations indiscriminately targeting uh, Mexican uh, Americans who were U.S. citizens and Mexican Americans who were non-U.S. citizens. Um, um, the, the benefit of that liberalization, though, was that, you know, suddenly there were many more people coming from uh, 
you know, not non-European countries as immigrants. Aliyah, um, can you talk about um, the, the sort of waves of Muslim and South Asian and Arab immigration that happened sort of, you know, from the 1965 period to before 9-11 and their relationship to whiteness and, and sort of coming into this, the structures that exist in this country? Yeah, thank you for that. And um, thank you to Claudia. I've already learned so much um, and jotted down some ideas. So this is already um, a really informative for me conversation. Um, so, you know, when we think about um, sort of the, the pre 9-11 immigration, like Carl had mentioned, sort of this period after the 60s, um, I think about my father and my mother and my aunties and uncles, people who came um, to the US who were doctors, nurses, engineers, professionals. Um, the, the change in the, um, in, in the immigration rules sort of allowed um, for an increase of um, immigrants from South Asia and Asia um, and really um, radically altered the racial demographics of the US. But it's important to note that sort of this prioritized um, immigrants with either direct family ties to current Americans, so people who had people here already, um, or high levels of scientific education, which sort of led to um, sort of the influx of these um, professionals. But, you know, it's also kind of worth noting, and I think um, so much of this history has been obscured, but, um, you know, obviously Muslims have been in this country um, since colonialism. Them. Um, there's always been a population of Black Muslims in the United States, and there's actually a large presence of um, South Asians and, and people from um, the Middle East and North Africa since the, the late 1800s. So that's, that's a part of a history that um, I don't think a lot of people know about, myself included. I, I think very much of, like I said, sort of the, the people in my family who came here, um, came here in the 70s. So, um, you know, this idea of um, the model minority stereotype, proximity to whiteness, proximity to power, um, you know, for me, Carl, you had mentioned this earlier, this idea of stories and of narratives and, um, you know, the, the model minority stereotype um, is one that, you know, was absolutely promoted within communities, but also um, something promoted by the government. Um, you know, this idea that assimilation was key to overcoming racial barriers and accessing citizenship, um, but also that um, it was held up as sort of a counter narrative to, to black poverty, to um, what we were seeing at the time, the rise of the civil rights movement. Um, you know, lifting up one community at the expense of sort of denigrating others and um, sort of that, it's, it's hard not to look at that, model minority um, stereotype um, sort of as you see it now and actually as it also is playing out right now amongst the same communities but um, really think I'm really thinking about it in the context too of helping perpetuate anti-black racism in this country but um, you know many South Asians um, sort of took this um, racial bribe of climbing the racial ladder in an attempt to reach the status of whiteness and um, and of course um, we'll, we'll talk later about 9-11 and how it really put into question this idea of belonging um, what it means to be American um, really gets called into question and becomes conditional but um, you know I think at that time um, this narrative was really used um, in different ways and it also obscures um, the complexity of the experiences of immigrants who didn't fit into this stereotype and so um, you know the the Middle Eastern Arab South Asian communities are extremely diverse and um, whether whether it's you know class caste immigration status um, those who may have integrated themselves more with other communities of color um, sort of the model minority myth um, sort of my experience growing up my father was a, a surgeon we lived in a upper middle class Jewish suburb I was one of um, one of a few um, brown um, South Asian Muslim families in, in, the, um, in the area um, really sort of obscured the fact that there were actually many uh, South Asian and, and Middle Eastern communities that were much more integrated both um, sort of in, in sort of the space and, and living space, but also in, um, in terms of industry where they were working um, as well as organizing, that there was actually organizing across cultures and causes. Um, but that's obscured a little bit with this model minority um, stereotype of, um, you know, working hard, focusing, education, staying quiet, not getting involved in politics. Um, and so, 
it's interesting for me to sort of look back at that time. Um, it's really hard to sort of look back at those communities without the lens of post 9-11. Um, but I know that um, there's been a lot of conversations in, in organizing and movement spaces right now about confronting anti-Black racism within um, our communities and um, the importance of recognizing that. Um, you know, when we perpetuate anti-Blackness, we're also complicit in reinforcing systems of oppression that harm, harms us as well. Um, so I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Yeah, thank you. And, it, um, you know, about the model minority stereotypes, that, that's something that we're going to be diving into a lot mm -hmm. with the session that Satsuki is leading um, later this year because that, you know, that's also a part of our own story as Japanese Americans and sort of trying to, uh, you know, rebuild our lives in the context of the America that existed, you know, after the camps closed, after the, the end of World War II. And actually, Carl, can I say something, you know, um, yeah. it's come up very recently for me in seeing um, sort of narratives that are used in the context of the Muslim ban and how many of the stories that we've seen or the, the families that are impacted, Muslim and I should say African travel ban, um, often sort of highlight like the, um, the best of the best or the, the high credentials that, that people have to show that the ban is um, affecting uh, so many different people. And look at this scientist who's, you know, denied access or um, this family who's been here for 50 years and their husband is abroad. Um, and I, you know, I think it can be strategic to do that, of course. These sympathetic stories, these, um, these stories that I think most people will say, like, that doesn't seem right. You know, that person would be contributing to society. But um, really the harm that sometimes uplifting those specific narratives can, can do to the fact that um, everybody, regardless of um, how they're contributing um, or, um, you know, sort of who they are, what their background is, should be allowed to be reunited with their families. And, you know, as American citizens, um, as people who are lawfully um, here in the U.S., they, they should absolutely have their families come. So it's, it plays out now post 9-11 as well. Thanks. And I think that's a great segue to, um, you know, the, the growth of both the prison system and the immigration detention system, you know, as, you know, each of our communities was sort of, you know, trying to slot themselves into these places and, and into the, you know, these roles that um, all the, you know, folks may not have been aware of it at the time really were sort of helping to contribute to these systems. Uh, Claudia, can you talk about that? Yes, absolutely. Um, and again, this is uh, for me more in the context of um, of Texas, right? And I think we often talk about um, Texas as this lab, right, where um, a lot of horrible things are tried, and then if they work, they're, uh, they go to different parts of the country. But um, so between 1993 and 1998, uh, the Texas imprisonment rate actually almost doubled. Um, and that happened because there were change in, um, in policy that, that made it so. So during, um, you know, the, the 1980s, right, is when the war on drugs, which is eventually what pushed my family and I out of our homes, um, actually increased prison um, admission rates, the, the domestic war on drugs. Um, and essentially what happened um, is that Texas legislators approved the building of over 100,000 new prison beds um, within five years. And so the other thing that happened um, was that people were outraged over short prison stays, right? And I think we'll, we'll get into what a prison really does to a person and what it is um, a little later, but um, I think public outrage of uh, mostly white folks <laughs> in Texas um, caused lawmakers to pass legislation to ensure that incarcerated people served a greater proportion of their sentences behind bars, right? <clears throat> so for example, um, some violent offenders were certainly required to serve at least 50% of their sentences before they were parole eligible, um, which effectively doubled the length of prison stay that they had. Uh, for many incarcerated Texans. And so there was really no balance between admissions and releases from prison, which just made the number of people who were in prison um, explode. Again, uh, there were over 100,000 new prison beds built within five years. Just when you think of that number um, and the population in some of the towns that we live in, you can, you can like really put it into context how huge that number is. 
Um, and it is no coincidence that around that time, uh, the founder of Corrections Corporation of America, which I mentioned before, um, he was a very prominent figure in the, the criminal uh, justice system, um, especially in the correction um, side. You know, he was serving on different boards and he just had a lot of stake and input into designing the system that we have right now. Um, he, in the 1980s, he starts exploring private prisons, um, building one in Tennessee that was then sued because of horrible conditions, right? But then he brings that to Texas. And in the 1990s is when you start seeing more, um, you know, private um, detention centers and, and jails and prisons built um, here. And again, we um, have a huge number of private prisons and it is, um, you know, it is in part uh, due to the fact that uh, T. Don Hutto, was sort of at the at the helm of both the correction side on the criminal uh, justice system, and then he was also designing um, the you know for profit detention centers or private detention centers. You know, I think you know all all prisons and all detention centers are for profit, whether they're private or not. But he was really the one that. Um, that gave way to that. And so we had this sort of horrible, perfect storm um, of this person merging these things together, right, for the worst. And, and that really gave way to a horrible boom of, um, of prison beds and detention centers. Yeah. I mean, I, while we're talking about the growth of all of these prisons and detention centers, um, I, I, I'd like to just um, like get an explanation from you about you know, are, are there actually differences? Like, you know, uh, who, are, who are the people that run prisons? Who are the people that run detention centers? Are they sa the same? Are they different? Yeah, that's a great question. And another thing that I failed to mention earlier was the, you know, both the the IRA, IRA right? Like the, the 1996, uh, both the crime bill, but also the immigration laws that gave way to just a huge number of people, uh, both on the criminal justice side and the immigration side, uh, being put behind bars. Having said that, um, I would say that I think for us, you know, and I mentioned earlier that at Grassroots, we are, um, our staff and our community members are comprised of both uh, people who have been formerly detained through the immigration system and, and detained or incarcerated through the criminal justice system, right? I have colleagues who have been behind bars for decades, um, and many of us who have been, you know, undocumented and formally detained as well. So, I think we've had a lot of intentional conversations, right? Because I think what happens often is that, um, you know, as immigrants, we're really eager to say, "Well, we're not criminals. We don't want to be treated as criminals," and we really push aside. Uh, the notion of criminality and going back again to a lot of the information that um, we have shared earlier of how this notion of criminality and the concept of innocence came out to be. Um, but I think where we land there, right, is that at the core of both prisons um, and detention centers is um, punishment, disposability, and a false sense of safety. That's how they are really um, justify right there are many models in the world where um the immigration system looks very different i don't think that any of them are perfect but there are places where people are not by default sent to a detention center when they enter a country and there are also models for um, what actual restoration looks like when harm is committed right so i think a lot of people when we talk about the abolition of detention and prisons think that in some way we're advocating um, for accountability not to happen, right? But I think accountability right now, it's really hard because the default is going straight to harsh punishment, whether that's in a detention center um, or a prison, right? And again, if you talk to people who have been in prison, right, I cannot speak for them. I can only speak for the experience that they have shared with me is that there's no restoration happening uh, in a prison, just like there's no care happening for migrants who are detained, right? And I think we'll get into what's happening um, in Georgia in a little bit. Um, but I think that, you know, um, for us, right, we have seen the abuses of um, lack of air conditioning in a place like Texas, where it goes up to like 110, 120 degrees in the summer. 
uh, medical mal malpractice and abuse, sexual abuse. Um, and the fact is that prisons and ICE are so criminal that if we are to get rid um, of punishment, we have to get rid of those institutions as well and really reframe safety. There's no way around it, right? I think, I think what's, um, what's at the core and what this moment is demanding from us is that we radically um, define, redefine safety and, and what that means for us. And I will say that I think as immigrants, right, sometimes, again, it's really hard to have these conversations, um, especially when you come from a country that has a failing criminal and legal system. Um, but again, I will call us back that those are the systems of, for me in my case, in Mexico, are colonizers. Um, and really briefly, I want to offer a very personal experience to highlight this, right? Because I think that at the end, um, this country needs and depends on our allegiance as um, immigrants to continue these systems of oppression that at the end are being used against um, Black and Native folks, right? Um, and so the moment you question this, you become disposable. But I was, um, I was actually abused as a child in Mexico. And, you know, when I came to the United States, I really, and I saw how you could easily just pick up the phone and call 911. I was like, if I could have done that in Mexico, I could have put my rapist behind bars, who was a very close family member, right? And it really took me seeing what prison, like what real accountability and restoration um, and being in relationship with people who are accountable looks like for me to land in the fact that that would have not solved the problem. That would have, you know, not really done anything for me or the person who harmed me and that we really needed to enter into radical accountability, right? That what I needed from the U.S. was not the ability to pick up the phone and call 911. It was actually a system that would have protected me, fed me, my family as a child. And so I think, again, we have to radically think how we think of safety and protection and being in relationship with one another to get at the core of why both prisons and detention centers are equally horrible and how to keep the prison um, industrial complex going, um, this country really depends on immigrants and our allegiance to those systems of, of punishment. Yeah, I, that, that's a super important point. And I, I think, um, you know, there, there are a couple pieces that I'm hoping we'll be able to get to about, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of things that law enforcement do that are responding to real harms that they, you know, that like people inflict on other people. But uh, the only responses that exist in our system are so inhumane and brutal um, that they end up just, you know, causing cascading further harms. And then there's a whole other universe of um, situations where law enforcement intervenes, where, you know, at best there's a real question about, you know, what, what harm is being inflicted on who, you know, is, is this a legitimate response? And I, I think we should also be talking about that. Um, but I, I want to, you know, uh, turn back a little bit to the history. We haven't talked about the post 9-11 response with, you know, you know, President Bush announcing the, the global war on terror, creating the Department of Homeland Security. Malia, can, can you talk about, um, you know, just sort of sketching out some of the deep impacts that this had on Muslim and South Asian communities in the United States and how the practices that existed, you know, that, that we've talked about being built up over the last couple of decades before that in U.S. prisons and policing migrated to the, you know, the sites of the war on terror. Thank you. And I'm so glad Claudia had mentioned sort of this idea of public safety and sort of the need to sort of unpack that or debunk that sort of what safety, whose safety, et cetera. And I think the same is true of the national security context. And oftentimes um, those things are considered somewhat separate, right? National security is what's happening abroad, military, and then, you know, public safety is what's happening domestically. And um, what we can see now in um, retrospect with um, the U.S. response to 9-11 is that um, while some aspects of it were unique in some ways, it very much built on 
systems that had existed for centuries um, where certain communities are dehumanized, um, you know, state sanctioned brutality and torture, um, and just the criminalization of communities through kind of control, incarceration, surveillance, et cetera. So, um, you know, like I had mentioned earlier and, and others have, Carl, you mentioned around the, the model minority too, you know, this was also a moment where um, Muslim communities um, in response to 9-11 as well, like you see the sort of good Muslim, bad Muslim narrative. How can you prove that you're American? How can you prove that you're one of the good ones and not one of the bad ones? Um, and just to describe like a few um, sort of immediate things that I hear a bit of an, okay, that's better. Um, a few things that um, happened um, post 9-11 and, and that the Center for Constitutional Rights actually responded to in sort of litigation and advocacy work. Um, sort of one was the, um, the sweeps of members of the Muslim, Arab, and South Asian community, um, people who are perceived as Muslims, um, the weren't, for example, like Sikh communities, um, um, non-Muslim, you know, other South Asians, et cetera, um, people who were swept up in the days following 9-11. Um, you know, um, they were um, basically like, there was a tip hotline, you know, someone will report that their neighbor, you know, looks Muslim or they're acting in this, this crazy way. It, it, especially in New York City, understandably, there was a climate of fear, and the government really created a system in which, um, can, in which people, um, purely because of how they looked and their identity, were swept up, and ultimately, um, 1,200 South Asian and Arab men were arrested in sweeps, um, 750 of them were ultimately detained on just immigration violations and eventually deported. Um, we had a case that went all the way to the Supreme Court called um, Turkmen v. Ashcroft about, um, you know, men who were put in, um, in a, basically a prison in um, Brooklyn, New York, um, and were subjected to really horrific um, prison um, conditions, solitary confinement, and other abuse, um, not because they were part of any criminal investigation or there were any charges against them, but they were swept up in this net and, and ultimately detained on an immigration violation. Um, there was also a Muslim registry, and I think most people know that because of um, President Trump and sort of a um, a threat to kind of bring that back, but the NSEERS program um, required um, all men who are 16 years and older from a number of Muslim majority um, countries to register with the government, um, check in regularly with immigration officials, and it was a way for the government to keep track of those, you know, leaving, um, entering the country, et cetera. There was also a huge um, human mapping and surveillance program, and I won't go too much into detail, but um, sort of this surveillance, both on a local level um, with the NYPD, for example, another case that um, CCR sort of litigated, as well as sort of federal government surveillance. And, you know, much of what we know about the surveillance program um, by the NYPD was actually because in 2011, <laughs> documents were leaked and, and journalists had sort of pieced together this um, suspicionless program that, um, covered New Jersey, New York, um, Connecticut, sort of the Eastern seaboard. Um, and it was really premised on this idea of like predictive policing, not because people had any tie to suspicion or criminal activity, but that um, just by the sheer fact that people identified as Muslim, um, that they practiced their religion in certain ways, that they were part of ancestries of interest, you know, countries, over 25 countries, including Indonesia, Afghanistan, Chechnya, and also American Black Muslims. Um, um, they were under, you know, they were suspicion um, that a focus, the radicalization theory, which is a focus not on what you, not on actions or on actual violence, but that, um, you know, religious practice, religiosity can be indicators of potential kind of harm or, or crimes. Um, so officers were sent to cities to identify hotspots and like hotspots were hookah bars, halal shops, mosques, et cetera. Um, and, you know, it, it became clear over time that that program never led to a single lead or investigation um, after operating for more than a decade. Um, you know, for surveillance, the FBI surveillance as well, there's a very long history that I think many folks um, here know, even from the inception of the FBI um, in the 20th century, um, uh, COINTELPRO, um, the infiltration um, of Black-led movements in the civil rights era, um, and then in the post 9-11 moment, we're seeing how the national security apparatus um, has been waged against Black-led organizing right now. Um, this idea of like a Black identity extremist, um, which is a, a particular designation. Again, this concept that ideas are the problem and not 
not violence. Um, so there are many other things that um, Muslims and um, um, those perceived as Muslims experienced in, in post 9-11, which I'm happy to go um, more into. And then of course there's like the interpersonal um, violence and the harm and, and the hate crimes, et cetera, that, that have happened, you know, a familiar um, go back to your countries or um, people feeling the need to have American flags up. Um, you know, my family, um, I was 17 when 9-11 happened, and I'd like to say that I was <laughs> politicized and um, knowledgeable of what was going around, going on around me at the time, but I, I wasn't. I, I think I was in a little bit of a bubble. It wasn't really until I started working at the ACLU and then the Center for Constitutional Rights that I realized um, how much Muslims had been targeted in our country. And I think that also goes um, to some of the things that separate um, particular communities. Um, you know, many of the people swept up, obviously, in New York City um, because of their immigration status. They weren't citizens. Um, many um, were undocumented, et cetera, which made them more vulnerable. And so we see that people who have kind of multi multiple vulnerabilities in that way too um, experienced um, some of these systems differently, but that ultimately um, all, all Muslims, those perceived as Muslims were according to the government in some ways um, sort of a target regardless of, of some of those differences. Um, Carl, did you ask about Guantanamo? I, I forget if you've asked about that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, the other part is the, um, you know, you work a tremendous amount on Guantanamo and how much of the, the sort of architecture of Guantanamo and the practices of, of Guantanamo depended on um, tools that had been used against black and brown people uh, in U.S. prisons and policing. Yeah, so um, this, what you, the story you had mentioned before about like, um, sites of history and architecture. Um, you know, the Center for Constitutional Rights um, first encountered Guantanamo not in post 9-11, but during the 90s when the Clinton administration um, had used um, Guantanamo as a place to house um, Haitian um, asylum seekers um, who were HIV positive and basically used that as a place for um, not quite in the US, outside the law, but a place that the US was holding. And so Michael Ratner, um, the late Michael Ratner, pre a former president of CCR, worked on that and basically tried to assert the rights of um, those Haitians um, at the time. And so when we saw that the government um, was transferring citizens from other countries, onto a U.S. Naval Center. We didn't know who was going there, um, their names, anything about them. He recognized the need um, to intervene and basically that it would be truly um, awful if the United States created um, a prison um, outside the law with no oversight, etc. So, um, so in a very real sense, the architecture of Guantanamo as we know it now existed before, just a different a different population of people. Um, and then no surprise that even the Trump administration when it was contemplating where to house um, migrants now and migrant children even contemplated rumor had it um, putting them at Guantanamo. So when you create these like physical sites um, where many of these, um, you know, these systems have um, been perpetuated, you sort of leave it open for that. Um, and then there's like a very practical um, way to trace some of the connections. And I'll just jot down a few examples. Um, you know, I was really struck by, um, I, I did an event with Mike Ishii and a colleague, um, Salim, at this incredible um, organization in Pennsylvania. And Salim had talked about, um, we were reflecting on the anniversary of Guantanamo and he had talked about how one of the guards at the prison where he was incarcerated, like notoriously abusive, awful, um, actually was one of the guards at Abu Ghraib in Iraq and was um, Charles Grainer was his name. And he is in some of the most um, disgusting and awful photographs from the torture of that time and how, um, you know, quite literally um, took sort of his experience in the um, carceral state within the US and kind of exported it. There's another example of um, uh, an investigator, Richard Zuli, who um, was part of decades long um, police torture in Chicago, um, interrogations of black men there and exported um, much of what he was doing in Chicago to Guantanamo and the torture of a man, Muhammad Uslahi. Um, so there are like very specific examples of these things connecting, if you think about like in the air, sort of a plane flying. But of course the architecture of these prisons abroad mimics super, super maxes within the United States. 
Um, and so there's a lot of a lot of connections there. But unfortunately, many of these prisons that are um, associated with war and with um, you know, with national security are often like divorced from the, the domestic conversation. And so really excited to um, see where organizing can go of bringing those things together. I mean, Guantanamo is the most expensive US prison. So when we're talking about abolition, um, when we're talking about defunding police and defunding the military, these things are very much connected. Um, and, and bringing things up, you know, uh, very much to the present, Claudia, um, you know, I, I think all of us have read about um, you know, the, the whistleblower reports of detained women being subjected to hysterectomies against their will and other sterilizing surgical procedures at, at this detention center in Georgia. Um, what's the context here and how does this, you know, what's happening in Georgia relate to the denial of bodily autonomy in yeah. incarceration and detention more generally? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I was really disturbed, um, even though I know some of these things have been happening, you know, I was detained for a month um, in Michigan, and I witnessed firsthand uh, just medical neglect and medical abuse happening, you know. Um, I do think that in the context of um, bodily autonomy, right, like, we have to know that there's no such a thing um, once you enter the system, whether it's a criminal justice system or the immigration system. I think it's pretty clear um, you know, my colleagues who are formerly incarcerated always tell me this, that when they got out, whether it was um, on parole or probation, um, it's really invasive. You have to continue to do check-ins. You know, sometimes folks are released with like an ankle um, shackle, you know, that just doesn't allow to live your um, life normally. Like you have no control of your body, where you go, what you do, even though you're outside of like the cage. And I think it's the same thing with um, with immigration, right? I have a colleague, a uh, grassroots, who's also formerly detained. And when we started going to Huddle and organizing with the women, we were both banned from the detention center, even though these places were literally built to the same people like us. And so we just thought of like how our own bodies, like at what point are we going to ever have control over them once you enter the system? Like there's no such a thing um, on that. But you know, I think what I will say is that the other thing is that there's no such a thing as consent inside a detention center or a prison, right, where officials are pretty much untouch untouchable um, and the power dynamics are so unbalanced. So these people have complete control um, over you, over your body, over everything you do. And if you don't like it, what they'll do is they'll usually, you know, if you refuse medical care or what they call medical care, um, or if you refuse to do anything they're telling you to do with your own body, they can actually file complaints against you that then go on your file and can be used against you for any reason. Um, and, you know, we also have to know that detention centers are not hospitals, right? I refuse this routinely to take people to specialists to save costs, right? So when I saw this um, procedures being done, I thought if they are so concerned, then they should release people to get the care they need. Like these things should not be happening in there. Um, but again, we have seen medical neglect and abuse happen, particularly against um, Black, Indigenous, uh, women of color in this country um, for centuries. So I can't say that I was surprised, but I was really disgusted, right? Because he brought me back to the moment where I was inside those cages and I like, witnessed those, not, not exactly the same thing, but the same concept, like the things that, again, just allow for these systems to at any point do whatever they want with your person and with your body. So um, it's really horrible. And I have no doubt that this is happening every day in our prisons and detention centers. So um, we just have a few minutes before we're gonna move to the breakouts. And I, I think I wanna shift from abuse to hope. Um, yeah. I, you know, one of the, uh, and especially about this question of like, you know, how can we reimagine all of these questions of public safety, of uh, immigration, of, um, you know, how the U.S. relates to uh, the rest of the world? Um, and, it, you know, uh, on the policing side of it, I think one model that we can look to is what's going on in Minneapolis, where uh, there are um, Black organizers um, and tons of allies who are mobilizing to um, not just defund the Minneapolis Police Department, but actually remove the police department from the city charter and replace it with a 
reimagine Department of Community Safety and Violence Prevention that will be led by somebody who has experience in non-criminal legal system, restorative justice, public health, you know, you know, all of the, the sort of helping professions and, um, you know, really be able to look at these questions of community safety from an entirely different perspective with different personnel who have the training to help people and the mission to help people rather than merely punish them. Um, so that, that's one uh, source of hope. I, Alia, Claudia, like, you know, what, what are some things that we can look to? Um, yeah, um, I can go first. I mean, I think, I think going back to, um, for me, this concept of safety, right? I always look back to my community and, and see again, some of the organizing that's happening, just like Alia mentioned earlier, like some of the uh, Supreme Court decisions that have had most, most impact come out of organizing. So because I am an organizer and I am in relationship with many people who have been harmed and who continue to remind us our ancestral practices of joy and celebrating each other and just pushing no matter what. Um, I feel, you know, even though right now it's a moment where activists and many other people are being prosecuted, um, you know, I really take hope in knowing that my community keeps me safe. The fact that I'm here sharing my story, it feels like a safe space. Um, and also the fact that people have been fighting for generations, right? And I do ground myself in knowing that I am not going to be free as an immigrant until Black people and Native people are free in this country. And just seeing those fights, um, and again, the sort of the, the you know, the joy um, and hope that people carry in their lives, um, just gives me all of really the energy um, I need and being in community with people like all of you. I love the question. Thank you for asking that, Carl. It's really important to stay um, hopeful um, to keep the, the work and the fighting continuing. Um, I think for me, like I've been, um, I've been shocked and really impressed with how narratives have shifted in such a short amount of time. And of course, there are um, unfortunate reasons for that, um, including COVID, the fact that people, many people are sort of in front of their TVs or their computers and they can't look away. Um, and so, you know, I went to a conference in December um, in Mississippi about um, mass incarceration and had a lot of abolitionist speakers. And I was frankly the first time I'd really been confronted with the concept of like, you know, how do you grapple with this? Like, ugh, how do you, but what about, you know, and and then all of a sudden everybody's talking about abolition now and not to say that everybody is on board or fighting for it yet, but people are talking about it. People are talking about prisons and detention centers and jails in a way um, that, you know, the COVID and Free Them All has really helped um, us see that these things are the public health crisis, you know? Um, so I think that, you know, narratives can shift and they can shift in part because the organizing has happened for so long, right? It didn't come out of nowhere. It's because people have been building and working and when the moment turns, which can sometimes be in an instant, they're ready sort of with the information. Um, the other thing too is that there, I've seen a real desire of, of, by people um, to want to protect their communities, to want to know their rights, like great resources, which I can drop, drop in the chat of, you know, when you go to protests, like how to, um, how to handle interactions with federal agents, et cetera, um, that will help people both be informed about themselves, but their, their people around them. So, um, you know, I think, I think there's a, like a lot of work to be done. And I appreciate that this conversation has not focused on the election because I think we've also, you know, realized, as we said, um, every administration in this country has been responsible for these harms and for oppression and have, um, you know, hurt many communities. And so um, this organizing has to happen regardless of who's in, in office and in January. So I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful in seeing people on the streets, like on chats. I mean, there are 112 people on this conversation on a Saturday right now, like that gives me hope. And um, for, um, for me and my colleagues at CCR, it's really um, the clients and the people we represent, like they're not, um, they're fighting, so we have to fight. I talk to um, my client at Guantanamo, um, one of our, our clients every month, and um, he's optimistic because he has no choice to be. And so um, that, that, that's a reminder to me that these things are urgent and important. Thanks. 
Um, I'm going to turn it over to Mike, who's going to talk about the breakout groups and then uh, how we're going to come back in the larger group after that. Thank you, Carl. Um, thank you, Claudia and Aaliyah. This has been um, a really powerful, amazing conversation. Um, so um, for our viewers, um, we want this to also be an interactive experience for everybody. So what we're going to do now is we're going to send you into breakout rooms. There's nothing you have to do. We will sort you and send you into rooms where you'll be in small groups for discussions for 15 minutes. Um, when you get into your group, we'd ask that you just take a moment to uh, introduce yourself um, and maybe say where you live. and we want to think of these um, these rooms as as really small versions of the human community. So we ask that people treat each other with respect, that everyone have an opportunity to speak, that no one speak twice before everyone has an opportunity to speak once. Um, and so you'll have to kind of gauge um, the number of people versus 15 minutes just to make sure that everyone has an opportunity. Um, so there are a couple questions that we've kind of come up to help you shape your conversation. The first one is, what is one thing that you learned from this conversation with these three individuals today, these three content experts? What's one thing that you learned today? And a second question you might address is, what is one thing that you would still like to learn more about after this conversation? So um, this is a chance for you to think and reflect and share with each other. We're gonna send you to groups and then after 15 minutes, everyone will come back into this large setting and we'll actually hear um, a report uh, from a couple of your groups. We won't have time to do everyone, but I think it would be nice for us all to sort of share a little bit. And then we'll have a few minutes to, um, to also field some questions that you've been putting in the chat boxes and that maybe uh, a few people will have live. So we're going to send you to groups now, and we'll see you in 15 minutes. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody. Um, I know, yeah, I know the 15 minutes was not nearly long enough. Of course, this whole conversation is so rich. There are so many threads to it. There are so many important issues to unpack, dig deeper in, go granular on. And of course, this is just the beginning. Um, but just to share a little bit, I thought maybe uh, we could hear from two people from different groups. What did your group talk about and what were some of the issues that surfaced for, for you all? If you would like to uh, participate, raise your hand and I can call in a couple people. Okay, how about Lauren Sumida? Oh, hi everybody. Um, we had a very small breakout group of two, um, so it allowed us to dive in deep. And I think um, our biggest takeaway was um, to really uh, talk, or let me gather my thoughts. Um, we were really struck by how um, the history of our communities and other communities um, from this panel and this conversation um, really is a blueprint for so many of the carceral systems that we have today. And so for me personally, I feel like I have a lot of reading to do, but um, it was, I think I'm just sitting with uh, how um, how much of, like if we turn back to the history, we can, if we really ground ourselves in that, it's a way to build how we move forward. Thank you, Lauren. Um, I think Christine Nakashiba raised her hand. Would you like to make a comment, Christine? Sure. Um, Lauren, that's beautiful. I, I felt exact, I felt, I left feeling exactly the same way that I need to, I want, I need to learn more history. And um, one of our group members gave the resource of some pilgrimage journey thing. Um, oh, the Nikkei block party at the Jip, uh, 
gem pil the pilgrimages, the Japanese pilgrimages that happened this summer, which I had no idea happened. So you can look that up. But um, our group, um, we talked about a lot, but I think the main takeaway for me was the idea that if ideas are the problem, not violence, then we need to create more safe spaces for everyone to share equally, like the rules you described for our breakout rooms. I think we need more spaces like that for like everyone to equally share and be heard. Um, I think the key is be heard. And then because it sounds like just being listened to brings people hope. It's such a like, like, like who knew such a small thing could make such a big difference. So that's. Thank you so much. Um, so a number of people wrote in questions during um, the conversation and actually even prior to the conversation. So I'm going to go back to Carl now because, of course, we can't cover all those questions. There were so many good ones. Um, I guess we're going to have to do another webinar. But um, Carl, maybe you could uh, address some of those questions with our esteemed guests. Yeah. Um, and, and first, I also just want to uh, go back to, um, you know, Mike had asked me to, you know, um, provide a little bit of definition on uh, from barbed wire to defund the police, the title of the session, and what defunding the police means. It's uh, not just about cutting police budgets, it's about what we do with the money saved uh, when it's not spent on policing, because, um, you know, about 95% of the 10.3 million arrests that police make every year across this country are uh, not for the things that make the headlines. It is not for murder, not for rape, not for aggravated assault, not for those more serious offenses, but a lot of the, you know, much smaller sort of quality of life issues, situations involving like mental health interventions that really like in a, in a better society would not be handled by people shouting with guns. And um, so, you know, when we talk about defunding the police, it is about saying, okay, like how are we actually going to build the systems in our society that keep people healthy, that support them, that prevent violence, and that, you know, when like, bad things happen can provide a compassionate response that leaves everybody better off than they were before instead of you know going down this repeating cycle of violence and abuse um so um you know that uh i now i want to turn to some of the questions um there was one question uh about um you know this whole issue of activism and organizing by people who are vulnerable to deportation including uh for you know uh you know friends uh who are non-us citizens um and family members who are non-us citizens including japanese nationals um uh, claudia can you speak to that yes um i will try to be brief um so absolutely, that is a very real concern. Um, and I'll just speak from you know, personal experience because I came to the United States in um, 2001, um, early 2001, and you know, I spent many years organizing and being really afraid, right? This, um, this line of undocumented and unafraid uh, gained popularity when I think a lot of um, undocumented youth started what we call it coming out of the shadows and declaring our status but for the first years that I started organizing I was always scared because my immigration status the immigration status of my family was always over my head and I always worry that not only for myself but for my family um, as well and I was really careful you know because again I had this ingrained sense of sense of safety and who could provide it and what that looked like so I was always really careful in what I said what I did but in 2011, um, my nephew was detained by the police and then by ICE. And everything sort of came crashing down. 
And I remember just wishing that I could go inside that detention center and, and get him out. And I never felt more unsafe in my life because the things that I fear most um, had happened to us. And so what happened is that I um, decided then in 2013 to infiltrate a detention center and sort of use all of the tools that I had learned um, to try to undo this and just system. And so I think the point that I'm getting at is that I felt safest organizing when I have done it with others and when I have known the system better than the system system has known me. Um, and when I infiltrated, I remember that I was really scared, but no more scared than I was when I was outside, like driving without a license or just living my life for my sister going to work. Um, the difference was that going in, I felt a sense of safety and security from the community that I had been organizing with, that they were going to organize, not to just get me out, but some of the other women that I was going to organize with from the east side. Um, and I think the last thing I'll say, though, I know that's pretty, like, out there, um, and that's not for everybody. I think we have to do a really super real risk assessment of how much risk we're able to take. I think there's different roles for everybody in the community. Like, not everybody has to be out on the street. Like, there's some people who are, like, you know, like, feeding people or just checking in on folks. Like, there's so many different roles, and we should really, um, one, we should really get to know the system very well. Um, whatever you choose to do don't do it alone like link up with community members even if it's virtually um and devise a, a safety plan especially for those who are undocumented let, let others know that you trust what you're up to um and and yeah and just like know that there's different roles for everybody and that whatever you do just don't do it alone and you know we have to trust that like again community members um, and other people have our backs and our safety at heart um, and that's really the only thing that <clears throat> kept me safe again I am currently in deportation proceedings I've been in deportation proceedings since 2013 and I continue to organize even now even as I know that I'm being surveilled and even you know like even as we're working um, to defund the police and all of these things because my safety is the safety that I've been taught ancestrally to define as people from the community, people that we love taking care of each other, not just being able to like call somebody with a weapon um, and come shoot at whoever's like harming me. So I think that's what's helping me be safe. But again, it's, um, it's real and we have to think and talk about it, just telling people like, don't worry about it. Like that's not, like, that's not okay because it's a very real fear that we have to uh, prepare for and just like deal with head on. Thank you. Um, and then there are a couple of questions about surveillance, including uh, JJ's question that I just saw in the chat um, that I, I think I'd like to try and combine together. Uh, you know, Aliyah and then Claudia, can, can you talk about um, the, you know, ways in which the sort of different forms of surveillance have impacted uh, the communities that you work with and represent um, and you know, whose interests that surveillance serves and what can be done about it? Yeah, I'll start off. I mean, one way that we've seen um, surveillance work both in the context of Muslim communities and also protesters is really the chilling effect, right? So um, that it's uh, the surveillance is sort of designed to prevent people from then doing the activity. So um, especially with protesters and, and various other people, whether it's animal rights activists, Black Lives Matter protesters, um, immigrants' rights um, folks doing this work, um, it's really a way for the government to say, we know we're watching you we know what you're doing and, and we're here and I loved what Claudia just said know the system better than the system knows yourself so that's both important in terms of protecting yourself from surveillance but um, also destigmatizing surveillance um, there was a great report put out um, around the NYPD mapping um, um, surveillance mapping post 9 11 um, that I can add to the resources later that really talk about how um, people didn't, you know, no longer wanted to either go to mosques or befriend new people because they thought they were informants um, or that, you know, they said at their Muslim Students Association college, like, we can't talk about political things, self censorship, you know, political activity online. Um, so, you know, I think it's it's a it's a good question because um you know one of the the desired effects is really to just chill dissent 
um, and, and make communities scared, divide communities from one another, um, and in some ways self, um, self surveil themselves. Um, so that's one of the, um, I think one of the driving forces behind it. Uh, yeah, I, I will just touch really briefly on surveillance, um, on like the fight to defund the police that we had locally in Austin. And I'm actually going to drop, um, we put together a website um, at Grassroots because we knew that a lot of our community members was really struggling with the idea of um, defunding the police. Um, and we, had, we wanted to really incorporate surveillance, gentrification, and many other things that were tied to it. So we put together a website that has the context for Austin, but also a resource list that goes into it. Um, and I will just say that we actually, um, so in Austin, we, in Texas, we have a, a law called SB4. And SB4 is basically like a show me your papers law, similar to the SB1070 law that a lot of people are familiar with in Arizona. And through that, that law basically prohibits law enforcement from refusing to cooperate with ICE. So it basically went into like all of the counties and forced all of the sheriffs to cooperate with ICE. Um, and so what happened after that, it went into effect in 2017, is that we said, um, well, if you're gonna do it, then we want to know exactly how you're cooperating with ICE. So what we did is that we passed laws locally that it, it didn't prohibit law enforcement from collaborating with ICE because we couldn't do that. But we were like, we want to know exactly how it's happening. And through that, we found that our local police department was sharing all of this information with ICE and other federal agencies through what's called um, the Austin Regional Intelligence Center, which is a fusion center, which, you know, really uh, exploded after 9-11. And they were actually like mostly used to surveil and prosecute um, Muslim people. And so we found that through that fusion center, um, our immigrant undocumented immigrant community and our black activist community and our Muslim community were being surveilled. Um, and so through that, we also found out that the funding to keep the Austin Regional Intelligence Center going was actually coming from the Austin Police Department. And so before like the uprising, this is all in like 2018, we started digging and digging and digging. And so, by the time that we, um, by the time that like the uprisings happened after George Floyd was killed uh, by the Minneapolis Police Department, we had all of this information that really got at how policing um, was being used through surveillance and gentrification to prosecute and displace people. And we went, so our police department was 40%, um, was a 40% um, our budget, 40% of our total budget was going to the police. And then we found that of all of our contracts, at least like, I think something like 40, 50% of all of the police contracts were being used for tech and surveillance technology. And Austin currently it's called like the Silicon Valley of the South because we have like Tesla and like we have Apple and all of these things that people are looking for. And it's like, they're the future, right? We're like a 20, I don't know what century we're on, like city. Um, things that like are always pushed on our community uh, were actually being like used against us to displace us. And um, you can see more there. And we also put out a report on surveillance and how that's led to gentrification. So we were able to take away a lot of money from the police. They're really upset. We took away 21 million and there's a uh, hundred and 21 million, I think, still up for grabs, which is effectively about 50% of their total, or a little less than 50% of the total budget. Um, but it's like a constant, you know, fight that we have going on. Um, because again, these policing technologies are a weapon that can be used against anybody whenever somebody decides to do so. Carl, can I jump in and add something? Like 30 seconds. <laughs> Ooh, okay. I'm going to drop a toolkit in here and encourage people to read more, which talks a bit about um, the countering violence extremism program that connects uh, federal law enforcement to sort of local communities, um, encouraging them to sort of self-surveil and prevent radicalism, et cetera. So the toolkits by a partner, I think it's great and it'll help um, kind of broaden the conversation around what defunding local police um, might entail in terms of federal cooperation and um, surveillance of Muslims as well. Yeah, um, that's great. And I, I think it's super helpful to 
close on this note where we're talking about local police departments because you know this is not all stuff that's happening in Washington DC it is something that is happening in our local communities uh, and it you know and there's also this flow of federal dollars that is supporting local police surveillance of communities of color and something that we can each push back against and organize against in our own communities um, and and you know bring their own experience as Japanese Americans to this uh, you know for example uh, my great grandfather Juro has an FBI file about that thick um, because of the fact that the FBI was cultivating informants inside the Japanese American community in Seattle before World War II and was using this in order to identify you know, which Issei men they were going to arrest preemptively uh, because they, you know, they had all of these suspicions about them and in much the same way that Aliyah's work today, you know, is, you know, uh, uncovering all of these horrible stories of how, um, you know, different like local, state and federal programs are targeting, um, you know, uh, Muslim, South Asian, and Arab communities for surveillance, um, and um, and even you know like putting people in situations where uh, they're coerced into becoming informants. So um, thank you. This has been an amazing discussion. Uh, I'm so grateful, uh, Alia and Claudia, for you know both of you for. Um, you know, all of the folks who, uh, you know, participated in, um, you know, the breakout groups and, and shared, um, uh, you know, everything that you discussed in the breakout groups. Um, Mike, I'm going to turn it back to you to close things out. Well, thank you, Carl. Yes, on behalf of Student for Solidarity, Claudia and Aaliyah, um, we just want to say thank you again. Um, we're going to drop their um, uh, organizational websites in the chat box, please visit Center for Constitutional Rights, um, Grassroots Leadership. They're doing amazing work. Um, we are so um, pleased and proud to partner with them in this continuing work. Um, clearly from this conversation, you can see that th we are only scratching um, the surface of, of really the conversation that needs to happen here. If you would like to see more in-depth conversation and programming from us around um, topics such as this, and then also diving deeper into sort of understanding maybe historical policy and laws, and also understanding how can we as um, community members get more involved in fighting um, unjust laws and policies and um, issues facing communities of color today. Please um, write to us, let us know your thoughts. Um, before I go uh, sign off today, I just want to just highlight that um, this is the second of four programs. Our third program hosted by Duncan Williams is on October 10th and will focus on multiracial identity and Japanese American community. And our final program on October 24th is led by Satsuki Ina and myself and takes up questions of Japanese Americans and Black Americans from the post-war era until now. You can learn more and you can register for these programs on our website. Um, people asked in the chat, uh, the first webinar and this webinar will also be posted on our website so that you can watch it again or you can share it with your friends. We'd also like to hear from you about future Sudo for Solidarity work. We are having focus groups next week on Monday, which is uh, September 21st, and Saturday, September 26th. You can register on our website to participate in these focus groups. And if you can't join us for the focus groups, we have a survey to get feedback um, around the work of Studio for Solidarity. And you can find that on our website and we will email it to all of you after this program is over. Once again, thank you so much everybody for making the time today to be a part of this conversation. Thank you to Claudia, Aaliyah and Carl. And um, from Queens, New York, I'm going to say goodbye now. Thank you, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Matt.